Welcome to Men Alive, a biblical journey to help us conform to the image of Jesus Christ. I'm your host, Paul Estabrooks. Our teacher is my longtime friend, Dr. Jim Cunningham, consultant in adult education, director of Go Teach Global, and author of the book, Men Alive. Jim, you mentioned that you and Rita were reading in the book of Job. Any lessons for those men experiencing loss from a trauma? Pablo, the story of Job's suffering tells us how not to be a counselor like Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, so much as it gives us some valuable lessons on how to deal with trauma. It appears these three friends caused more trauma than they healed. You and Rita took training in trauma counseling when you served with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and you taught the course in South Sudan and Ethiopia. Help our listeners understand a few principles to be of help to those suffering from what we call trauma. Let's divide our thoughts into three time periods, past, present, and future. The first question from past is understanding what happened to me. In the book of Job, our man Job is identified as the richest person in that entire region. Scripture says he was blameless, a man of complete integrity, who prayed regularly for his family. He was basically minding his own business, living life as normal, when he was chosen by God to be a proof test to Satan that Job would be faithful to God regardless of what happened. So Satan was given permission by God to test Job. Poof! One day, everything was swept away. His herds were stolen, his servants were killed, and all his children died. But the Bible says Job did not sin by blaming God. Then Satan, the accuser, ups the ante and said to God, You are protecting his health. If you take away his health, he will curse you. God answers and says, All right, do with him as you please, only spare his life. So Job was struck with terrible boils from head to toe, so much so that his wife said, Forget your integrity, just curse God and die. I like what Johnny Erickson writes about Job's life. While she is confined to her wheelchair, she says, The book of Job challenges us to see God's favor in the difficult, the crushing, and seemingly evil situations we face. Then she adds, Satan wants us to complain and protest, to get upset and angry and resentful and walk away from our faith. The first step is accepting our wounds or trauma. We need to accept what has happened to us. I read a story of a man whose brother was killed in a military exercise. The man telling the story asked questions like, If only he had, and if only I had. And finally he said to himself, No more if onlys. It happened. I must accept it. Life has no replays. That phrase stuck in my heart, Pablo. Life has no replays. All of us have wounds from one form or another. Some kind of pain or shame or fear or injustice resulting usually from a loss, like a death, an accident, an illness, or a displacement, an abuse, or an uncontrollable situation like a war or violence or persecution. We are all in the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ while going through various stages of suffering and healing from wounds, both wounds considered self-inflicted due to mistakes we made and wounds we did not deserve, such as a betrayal, shame, abuse, and loss. It includes walking with Jesus through the pain, mourning, and the recovery after any trial or trauma into a new hope and a future. The second step is understanding why did this happen to me? We are generally not able to answer the why question, such as why did God allow this to happen to me? But what we can do is look at the process that God is taking us through and try to understand where God was before and during the trauma. Where has God revealed himself to us in the many weeks and months since the trauma ended? At some point in the future, we want to see that what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. Just as Joseph said in Genesis chapter 50, 
But at this stage in the healing, we are trying to process the nature of the trauma wounds and deal with the post-traumatic stress. Helping a person see that they are not responsible for the trauma is foundational for the healing process to begin. They need to understand that God remains a loving and caring God. A huge question people ask is, where was God when this happened? The healing process requires an awareness of God, never leaving us nor forsaking us, an awareness of his presence. Right on, Pablo. Yes, there is grief, and yes, there is loss, deep loss. The pain is at times unbearable. But at some point in the transition to healing, we begin to develop a sense of perspective. Mourning, like seasons, has beginnings and endings. Ecclesiastes 12 gives that insight. David encouraged himself in the Lord at Ziklag after everything he owned and cherished was burned or removed. Scripture does not tell us what David did to encourage himself, but at some point each of us must come to the reality of responding in complete surrender by faith to the will and plan of God, even if it is not fully understood by us in this lifetime. Then we can go to the roots of healing, deeper levels of healing, and deeper levels of communication and intimacy with Christ. One helpful method of expressing your story is to write in a journal, telling God how you feel about what happened. Write out your questions like you would be talking to Him. Keep the story to yourself until you feel free to tell your story in a safe group setting. You are listening to Men Alive with Dr. Jim Cunningham of Go Teach Global. At the end of the program, I'll share contact information for you, our listeners. Okay, Jim, your three points help cover the past. What do we say about the present as we determine our responses to what happened? Many will ask, will I ever be the same again? Chuck Swindoll said it this way, The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than success, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on that one string we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. I like that phrase, life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. A further question people ask is how can I live with this scar? Scars heal. Scars no longer hurt, but they remain visible. I have a scar in my forehead from when I was 10 years old. I fell on the ice playing goalie in a hockey game. The doctor clamped the skin together and said, it will heal and never show any stitch marks. Seventy years later, I still have the scar, but no pain. Like a tribal scar, there is no further physical pain after the cut has healed. But just as visible scars remain, so do invisible scars remain as consequences in the future. Okay, Jim, what about the future? Is there any hope after the trauma is over? What are our options? Consider the number of times in Scripture where a person's attitude changed and there was a change in the outcome, both negatively and positively. Negatively, Judas changed his attitude towards Jesus and ended up betraying him. Positively, Peter repented from his denial of his Lord and became one of the greatest evangelists in the book of Acts. Helping others through the healing process requires both the caregiver and the care receiver to have a right attitude towards those who caused the harm. 
Healing cannot be based on hatred. It requires our next step, forgiveness. Forgiveness is a huge part of healing from any trauma. Our SSTS text has a solid chapter on forgiveness. Contact us at menaliveuntogod at gmail for a copy. Prayer is a way to access our Heavenly Father so that healing and eventual understanding can take place. Forgiveness of the person who has caused hurt or persecution is essential regardless of what the other person does. We also realize that forgiveness of hurt takes time and is often a long process. In addition, as part of the grief process, people may even have temporary feelings of anger at God. Final question. How do we rebuild our life and restore our sanity? The final part of the grief process is restoration. For individuals, no matter how severe the wound, our goal is for them to work towards forgiveness first, healing, and where possible, reconciliation with the ones responsible for the pain. Sometimes a relationship will end because it is no longer healthy and there is no reconciliation, as in persecution or abuse. While we realize this may be a long-term process and is never easy, we accept that God's plan includes forgiveness. Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, but may not always involve reconciliation. Jesus did not get down off the cross and become reconciled to the soldiers. In the story of King Saul pursuing David in 1 Samuel 26, King Saul asked forgiveness of David for attempting to kill David. David forgave Saul, but was wise in deciding not to go back into a relationship with him. Trust had been broken. It was an unhealthy liaison. King Saul was a disturbed man, and David would not have been safe in his presence. Healing from a trauma is not always one miraculous event. Sometimes people revisit a trauma or even an addiction and they must seek God's help again and again to move forward. The memories of some traumatic event recur on the anniversary date of the event. On the last day of one trauma healing seminar, the participants wrote on slips of paper what we called the pain in our heart. They brought the slips of paper and dropped them in a box in front of a wooden cross at the front of the room. Then we took the papers outside, formed a circle, and burned the papers. An amazing thing happened. The participants began to sing a hymn. Some said this was the first time they had been able to sing since the trauma occurred. Look at what happened in our opening story of Job. When Job prayed for his friends who had harmed him emotionally, the Lord restored his fortunes twice as much as before. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than the beginning. We must eventually accept that all things do work for good according to God's good and acceptable and perfect will as described in Romans 12 verse 1. As Joseph said to his brothers after the traumas he experienced of being betrayed by his brothers, kidnapped, sold as a slave, falsely accused of rape, imprisoned for years, and living apart from his family for all those years from mid-teens till age 30. You meant it for evil, he said, but God meant it for good. There you have it, men. Thoughts for helping ourselves and others through difficult times when experiencing a trauma. Send Dr. Jim your comments and questions at menaliveuntogod at gmail.com. And be sure to visit our website to find many helpful resources. Go to goteachglobal.com. That's website goteachglobal.com. Until next time, I'm Paul Estabrooks on behalf of Dr. Jim Cunningham, encouraging you to be Men Alive, a fully committed follower and disciple of Jesus Christ, until we see him face to face.